Good morning. Welcome back to uh, Advanced Computer Algebra. We were talking about polynomial multiplication. Uh, last time we, we discussed polynomial multiplication uh, for the case when the ground field is algebraically closed. And we have seen that in this case we can solve the multiplication problem extremely qu quickly, uh, very efficiently, um, using uh, the idea of the fast Fourier transform. The fast Fourier transform is an operation that is not only used for uh, polynomial multiplication but has many other applications and we are not discussing here. Um, um, and it's, uh, it's very efficient, so uh, that's very that's why it's so attractive for many other applications as well. And uh, what does it do, the Fourier transform? Uh, it's a matrix vector multiplication that turns a vector of coefficients of a polynomial into a vector of values of this polynomial at, uh, with the evaluation points that are uh, powers of a primitive root of unity. And you remember that a root of unity uh, was a field element whose nth uh, power is 1, and it's a, called a primitive nth root of unity if no smaller power uh, of the element is 1. Okay, so uh, now we want to generalize this and go a step further and uh, talk about what we do uh, if we have polynomials uh, with coefficients in an, in an arbitrary ring, a commutative ring, um, but uh, we want to drop the assumption field and we want to uh, drop the assumption algebraically closed. So about the assumption field, there is actually uh, nothing uh, to be changed because uh, in the algorithm we discussed last time, we actually never did division. Um, there was only, only at the very end, uh, in the inverse uh, DFT, we do a division by the length uh, of the vector, uh, but uh, that was already problematic last time because the length of the vector might be zero, might be uh, not yeah, the the, uh, the length of the vector is a certain integer, a positive integer, but that integer may be zero as element of k. So when I divide by it, so that I cannot divide by it. Um, and we repaired this by saying, okay, I, I, instead of computing uh, the coefficients of the product, I compute n times the coefficient of the product, and that may or may not be zero, but I do this for two co-prime n's, and then I use the extended Euclidean algorithm to uh, linearly combine the results to uh, the coefficients that I'm really interested in. Um, and with this, we have eliminated a division. There's no division anymore in the algorithm, so uh, uh, division is not an issue. What is an issue is this uh, algebraic, uh, algebraically closedness. And uh, uh, this is uh, what we have to worry about. So, so let me recall uh, again what, the, the, what, we, what we achieved last time. Uh, the setting was that we had two polynomials uh, whose degree is less than n and uh, we found that we were able to compute the product of them mod x to the n minus 1 using n log n operations in the ground field. Okay, so we want to compute really the product. Well, so why is this uh, here not the product but the remainder of the product with this uh, uh, polynomial? That's uh, uh, because uh, I'm assuming here that n, uh, yeah, that, uh, that this is a, uh, these are polynomials of degree less than n. Uh, I, and and uh, the, the product of them may have a degree that is uh, larger than n. But I want to, um, yeah, I want to uh, fix, fix the n here. Um, if, if I want to uh, really have the product, and I can just choose the n, which is only an upper bound here, I make it so large that it's bigger than the sum of the two, and then uh, the sum of the two would be the degree of the product, and then if I take here mod uh, x to the n minus 1, it will not change anything, so I, uh, it really doesn't uh, harm very much that we have this uh, remainder here, but where does it come from? It comes from the interpolation problem, so uh, from the interpolation step in the multiplication algorithm. 
you remember that the last step was that I computed the uh, coefficients of the product from the values of the product and the interpolation says we have if we have n interpolation points then we can always obtain a polynomial of degree uh, less than n that matches these interpolation points and this polynomial is uniquely determined by the uh, evaluation points uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, this polynomial which is the one that I want to compute may have larger degree as we just said but it is constructed in such a way that it has the, the same values as f times g on the roots of this polynomial. Um, because that's what really the interpolation produces. It, it produces a result that uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, yeah, some, somehow uniquely determined mod this polynomial. So there's one solution that is, has degree uh, less than n and every other solution uh, differs from the output of the interpolation algorithm by a multiple of this polynomial. Well, and that means conversely that if this is a polynomial that has the values that we want, and I take it mod this one, then it must the result must be the unique result of the uh, of the interpolation uh, algorithm. Okay, so this is where this can, comes from. Um, so where did we really use that k is algebraically closed? We didn't use it at all. Uh, what we really used was only that k contains root of unity, roots of unity, um, because otherwise we can't do the FFT. Um, k being algebraically closed means every polynomial uh, factors completely. Um, that's more than we really used. What we really used was that this polynomial factors completely. Um, because that's equivalent to saying that k contains a primitive nth root of unity. Remember that we had a lemma last time that said that uh, the roots of this uh, polynomial are exactly the powers of omega uh, when, uh, when omega is a primitive nth root of unity. Okay, so the algorithm from last time works if k is just a ring. And uh, uh, it also uh, it pro yeah, provided that uh, the ring contains suitable roots of unity, um, which may be the case, but uh, it doesn't have to be the case. So we have to worry or ask, what do we do if there are no roots of unity? Um, one, one idea is uh, if k doesn't contain a root of unity, then just uh, go to a go to an extension, uh, extend, uh, join a root of unity. You can always do this. You can always move from k to a larger ring that contains, in addition to all the elements of k, a root of unity. Um, and then uh, carry out the algorithm in this extended ring. And by the result from last time, we'll have n log n operations. And uh, it seems that we are done. But it's not true. We are not done because we get n log n operations in the extended ring. Um, but that's uh, not what we want. We want to have uh, a low number of operations in the original k and not in an extended ring. Uh, so we have to, uh, if we want to pursue this approach, we have to ask how many operations in k does it uh, involve to do n log n operations in the extended ring, where I join a root of unity, a formal root of unity, I do an algebraic extension uh, of k by uh, uh, a new element omega. Now the element omega is algebraic over k, and it has a minimal polynomial of degree n. So the extended ring would be an, uh, an, a, an extension uh, of degree n in which every addition uh, and multiplication requires at least n operations in k. So that means we have to multiply this n log n by n and then we get n square log n and that's not very comfortable, that's too much, we don't want to have this, we don't want to have n square log n. Uh, we will have to pay uh, for the roots of unity, we will construct roots of unity. Um, 
but we will not construct them in the way I just described because that uh, gives an additional cost factor of n and that's too much. We, uh, we will have to pay for them but not that much. We, have to, we want to pay much less. Okay, so now I, I, don't, I, I don't want to uh, keep saying that k is a ring. This is too confusing. Let's uh, call uh, the ring now r. And suppose that 2 is an invertible element. We have already discussed last time what uh, we do if it's not invertible. So uh, if, uh, if 2 is invertible, then I can just divide by a power of 2 uh, for the inverse FFT, uh, inverse DFT, uh, and then I'm done. And uh, if, <coughs> if uh, 2 is not invertible, uh, then um, we discussed last time how to get around this. So in order to simplify, let's assume that 2 is invertible. And the task is now, given two polynomials with coefficients in R, compute the product. And the idea is we create a root of unity and uh, then apply the idea from last time. So here is a ring which contains a root of unity. It, I take the polynomials in which f and g uh, live, the polynomial ring where f and g live, and I take it mod this polynomial, x to the p minus 1 for a certain p. Now this gives a new ring D, and <clears throat> it's a bit like a ring extension, right? Actually, it is a ring extension of R, um, and it, uh, uh, yeah. So this, 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 this is a, uh, uh, it's a ring extension of R where x is a primitive p root of unity, uh, obviously because x to the p is equal to one. That's what this equation says. This means that p is a root of unity, a p, that, sorry, that x is a p root of unity. And it's also a primitive p root of unity, because if I have x to the something less than p, uh, then taking it mod this polynomial will not change it, so it can become uh, 1. It can be equal to 1 modulo this polynomial. So this is, uh, this is good. Um, and uh, let's now see what... Um, what the, the cost of uh, a DFT is when the ground ring is this D. So wh what we have to do for a DFT is we have to multiply things by powers of roots of unity. Now x is a power of, uh, uh, x is a root of unity. So the question is what is the cost of multiplying a polynomial by x to the i? Now a polynomial is just a list of coefficients and if I multiply a polynomial by x to the i, it just means I shift the list of coefficients. Um, and uh, this doesn't involve any arithmetic operations. I don't have to add or multiply any coefficients for doing so. And that means that the uh, uh, multiplication of a polynomial, a plain polynomial by x to the i, is for free. Now the x in this ring is it's not a plain polynomial variable anymore because I'm taking this uh, polynomials here mod this polynomial. And in general, if this, is, if this were a, a different polynomial, some m, a minimal polynomial m, uh, then after multiplying by a something in this ring by x to the i, I would have to reduce by m. I would have to do a division with remainder. Uh, and the division with remainder is not for free. It would normally cost something. Um, but this polynomial is not an arbitrary polynomial, it's a very special polynomial, so I can see, I can tell uh, precisely what the effect of multiplying an element by x to the i is, uh, including the reduction by this polynomial, including the remainder computation. Because what happens if I multiply, for example, by x, uh, it would move this last coefficient out, and add zero in front and move everything one to the right. Uh, but here we'll have uh, f10 uh, times x to the 10. But x to the 10 is equal to one. So this f to the 10, uh, which drops out on the right, just gets inserted here at the uh, beginning again. So x times f has this coefficient vector. And so if you can keep, uh, keep going, um, you will see that the multiplication by powers of x just shifts the coefficient vector cyclically. 
and it's uh, still true, like for plane polynomials, that this doesn't cost anything. Of course, it costs something in a real computer, but if you only count uh, additions and multiplications in R, then this is for free. This doesn't cost anything. Um, okay, so uh, sh uh, multiplications by x to the i cost zero operations in R. And additions uh, in D are a bit more expensive because uh, every element here uh, of, of, of this D is... Uh, represented by an, a, a polynomial of degree less than p. Such a polynomial can have p coefficients. And then um, adding two such polynomials means I have to do p uh, operations in R, p additions. Okay, that's uh, what it is. And that's all I need to do FFT. Because for FFT, I never multiply uh, arbitrary elements of this uh, ring. I al al always multiply with powers of roots of unity and otherwise I only add. So I can uh, see, uh, yeah, I can reuse the ideas from last time. Uh, so let's say uh, we have a, a, a Q that divides P and uh, uh, then according to a lemma that we proved last time, uh, if I take omega the P over Q's uh, power of x, then this is a primitive q's root of unity. And I can ask what is the <coughs> what is the yes, uh, what is the cost of applying the dft of size q to f where f is a vector uh, with coefficients in d. Okay, so this is the multiplication, the matrix vector multiplication of this type. This is the DFT matrix, and this is the vector f, which has uh, coefficients that are elements of d, but the elements of d are themselves polynomials, so every entry here is a polynomial in x. And uh, we know that uh, uh, the FFT algorithm uses q log q operations in d, but what kind of operations? The operations are exactly the ones that we discussed before. They are multiplications by powers of rules of unity, and we said these ones are for free. In addition, there are, in the matrix vector multiplication, uh, there are additions of, uh, well, you take certain linear combinations of these polynomials, where powers of rules of unity are the coefficients of the linear combinations, and these additions still cost P operations in R. So uh, every operation is either uh, multiplication by this or an addition and we said an uh, addition in D costs P operations in R so uh, all together here okay here's an illustration uh, these elements are very simple that's why I uh, write them as dots and uh, these elements are uh, complicated they are arbitrary uh, coefficient uh, lists and these are just isolated coefficients of various degrees, indicated here by the colors. And the sizes here is this is a Q times Q matrix, and this is then a vector of length Q, but the vector contains polynomials of length P as entries. So altogether, the total cost of the, uh, applying the DFT is P times Q times log Q, if I count operations in R. Okay, so now consider two polynomials of degree less than Q with coefficients in D. So now uh, the, the D, remember, the D was this ring that uh, was obtained by the polynomial ring over R by taking it modulo an ideal. Um, and so the D here already contains a little x, the little x was the root of unity, and in order not to confuse the little x with the polynomial variable here, I choose a capital X here. So these are now polynomials in a new variable x with coefficients in D, and D uh, contains the little x from before. And the degree here refers to the degree in capital X. I want to multiply these polynomials using the idea from last time. So I can multiply them uh, modulo x to the q minus 1, 
uh, by uh, doing first an FFT computation so that I turn the coefficients, the given coefficients, into lists of values at powers of roots of unity. Then I multiply these values component-wise and I get the values of the product. And then I use the inverse FFT, inverse DFT, to turn the values into coefficients. So what's the cost of this? Um, we, we just argued that the cost of the uh, DFT is P times Q times log Q operations in the ground ring R. And here uh, I don't have to do much because here I have just Q multiplications. But I have to be careful because these multiplications here are multiplications in D because F bar and G bar are arbitrary elements of D uh, and arbitrary elements of D are, well, yeah, something where we don't know yet how to multiply them. Okay, so we have to, um, uh, yeah, what, what we really did here was we didn't, we, we, do, we don't solve the multiplication problem completely. Uh, instead, what we what we have is a, a, a way to reduce the multiplication problem for polynomials over D, uh, a single multiplication uh, of two polynomials over D in this uh, ring is reduced to Q multiplications in D at the low cost of the FFT. So this is the translation. We translated a single multiplication in this ring to Q multiplications in this ring. Now the, the rings look very similar. Um, so uh, the idea is now that these Q multiplications in D I will uh, do somehow by a recursive procedure. I will uh, set things up so that I can uh, do the multiplications here uh, exactly again uh, by, uh, by this idea here. Okay. So how does this work? Okay, let's, uh, <coughs> let's see. Uh, I start with polynomials that are uh, given as um, polynomials in a single variable little x with coefficients in a given ring r. And um, I, I will split them now and turn the uh, f and the g into bivariate polynomials. So I, I will split the exponents or the, the monomials in uh, x and little x into uh, monomials uh, that contain little x and a new variable cap capital X. Okay, so I will turn the uh, univariate polynomials into bivariate polynomials. Uh, okay, so let's say the degree is n and let's say that n is the power of 2, maybe the kth power of 2, and now I choose p and q. I choose p as, uh, well, okay, some uh, roughly half of the exponent in each case. So if, if k is even, then I can just split it uh, equally. But if k is odd, then I choose p as the smaller one and q as the larger one. In any case, what matters is that p and q are roughly square root of n. Okay. And then I uh, replace any uh, monomial x to the i in f and g by uh, x to the something, x to the something, here's the capital X, the new variable, and uh, I split the i into quotient and remainder upon defini uh, by a dif a division by p. Okay, I divide i by p and I get a quotient and a remainder. The quotient becomes the exponent of the new variable and the remainder becomes the exponent of the old variable. And this is made in such a way because Afterwards, if I replace x by little x to the p, then I get back to where I came from. So this is the idea. If I have a capital X and set it to x to the p, then um, I, I get here little x to the p times quotient plus the remainder, but that's, that's exactly i. Okay. So this is a substitution uh, that eliminates the capital X, and uh, this is the introduction that is made in such a way that the substitution uh, brings me back to where I came from. Okay, so uh, you, you can visualize this uh, operation here by saying that you, we split the 
F and the G into uh, Q chunks, each of which has size P, and Q and P are roughly of the same size. So it's not like in Karatsuba or in the extended version of Karatsuba that we discussed earlier, uh, that uh, uh, the number of uh, 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 parts is, is fixed. Uh, here the number of parts is uh, chosen in such a way that the number of parts is equal, roughly equal to the size of your parts. And then uh, this uh, in introduction of a new variable capital X amounts to making the turning the univariate polynomials into bivariate polynomials and that means that the, the coefficient arrays are now rectangular. They are not long lists but they are uh, roughly uh, square rectangles. Okay, and now think of these uh, as bivariate polynomials and let's say we want to multiply them modulo uh, capital X uh, to the Q minus 1. Remember this was the multiplication problem that we wanted to solve here. Uh, um, uh, what happens if we do this? So uh, in, in, in this direction uh, nothing changes because uh, if, if I multiply them mod something of degree Q, well then I get something of degree less than Q, so it, the result will look like this. But uh, if I look at the little x, then I have here something of degree P and here something of degree P. So if I multiply them together, the result will be something of degree 2 times P. So um, I don't want to destroy this. I want to keep this result of uh, degree 2 times p. Um, so if I want to choose a modulus and compute uh, the little x modulo uh, some uh, polynomial in little x, then I choose better, uh, I better choose a polynomial of degree uh, 2p so that I don't destroy the correctly computed coefficients of the product of these two bivariate polynomials. Okay, because they may they, they they fit into this extended box. Okay, so this is this is the conclusion. The conclusion is we do uh, a multiplication in this ring here, where I choose as d this ring, and then uh, I can uh, if if I can do this efficiently, then from this I can recover uh, the result of the multiplication of the univariate polynomials. I can. Uh, substitute x, capital X for little x to the p uh, and it uh, becomes again univariate and everything works out uh, and gives the correct result. Okay, now uh, we had previously said that we reduce a multiplication here to a multiplication in here and with this setting we will uh, be able to do a multiplication here exactly in the same way. So we will apply this idea recursively and uh, this is the idea of the Schönhage-Strassen algorithm. So uh, here, here is the algorithm written down uh, in detail but it just uh, contains nothing uh, new that it, uh, we have discussed it completely already. So it, this is just a summary. F and G univariate polynomials degree less than n, n a power of 2 and the task is to compute their product mod x to the n minus 1. Okay, it's a recursive algorithm, so there is a base case to be handled uh, if we don't want to descend into an infinite recursion. Uh, if n is below a certain bound, then just compute the product somehow. It doesn't matter how for the uh, uh, complexity. Uh, then you choose p and q roughly of the size of square root of n, and you turn f and g into elements of this funny ring. Um, Turning f and g into elements of this ring doesn't require any computation. It just means you're taking the long uh, list of coefficients and arrange it as a rectangular array. That doesn't require any computation. It just uh, means we are changing our algebraic point of view. It's the same data. Uh, we just interpret it differently. Now you set up your rule of unity. And we, we have made this choice of p and q such that if they are not equal, then p is the smaller one. So that means a p, a q is either p or it's 2p. Uh, and <clears throat> depending on this choice, I choose either x 
or x square so that um, uh, I, I get a, a qth root of unity. Okay, good. So I'll uh, apply FFT here and there using algorithm 4. We discussed uh, what this costs. And here I, I do the pointwise multiplications of the values. And for this I do a uh, multiplication modulo x to the 2p minus 1. And that's, that's what we uh, wanted to do here. So x is a 2p rule of unity. Um, so that's why I can uh, choose it x itself if, as, as then also a qth root of unity in d if q is equal to 2, otherwise I have to square it um, if p and q are equal. Okay, so um, uh, so here I use the algorithm recursively because the problem that I have to solve for each of these coefficients is of the same type as this. I can do a recursion and then I do an inverse FFT and uh, I get the result now H is expressed as a bivariate polynomial and still contains the capital X but then I do the substitution that sets X uh, capital X to little x to the p and then this is the uh, this is the result. Okay, this is the outcome. The question is what does this cost? And here's the answer. Uh, the, this algorithm uh, computes the product of any two polynomials of degree less than n modulo x to the n minus 1 using n log n log log n operations in R. So we still had to pay something for the root of unity, uh, for, for this idea of turning this x that is already there into a root of unity, but the price is much less than n. Uh, it's just log log n. Log log n is an extremely uh, slowly growing function. So it goes to infinity, uh, but it goes to infinity so slowly that it's fair to regard this as a constant uh, in practical applications. You will, you will hardly uh, recognize the, this uh, in, in a performance of an actual program. Log n is already uh, small uh, compared to n, but log log n is small compared to log n, so it's very small compared to n. Okay, so this is a good result, and it's the best that we know. For, for arbitrary rings, if you don't have any uh, and if you don't know anything about uh, R that you could exploit, uh, then uh, there's no better way, uh, as far as we know, uh, to solve this problem um, in a better complexity than this. Of course, if you know that R has roots of unity already, then you don't want to pay uh, for roots of unity, and you use those that are already there. That's what we did last time. Assuming k contains all sorts of roots of unity, we only need n log n operations um, to uh, multiply the polynomials. Okay, so <clears throat> now we should uh, see where this log log n comes from. This is an interesting calculation I want to uh, show you. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's see. Um, let's see the proof. Um, so remember we had uh, n was a power of 2 and we had p and q. And we said p is the smaller one of those and uh, q is the bigger one of those um, unless k is even when they're equal. But in any case uh, this is at most square root of n, and this is at most 2 square root of n. Now I have to uh, understand what is, the, what is the cost of applying the algorithm. So uh, I, I, will get a, I will get a recursion. Um, so let's see, uh, let's have a look at the algorithm again. Here, here it is. Um, the, the recursive step happens here. What, what do I have here? I have multiplications are how many? I have as many multiplications as these vectors are long. 
These are vectors of length q. Here uh, we see the q. Um, here we see it. Sorry. Here we see the q in uh, in the index of the FFT. So these are vectors of length q. That means I have to do q multiplications. And uh, what is the cost of a single multiplication? Well, that depends on what the n is in the recursive call. In the recursive call, I will compute the products here in, uh, in D. Well, what is D? Uh, I've, I've chosen D to be Rx mod x to the 2p minus 1. So the, uh, in the recursive call, the n will be 2p. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is the, what comes from the recursion. Will have Q recursive calls, and each of them will have, uh, yeah, will be a problem of size two p of the same type. And uh, then I have to worry about the cost that I spend or the time that I spend uh, inside a recursion, yeah, as at a specific recursion level. And there's nothing to do here or here or here or here. Well, here's one multiplication. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing to do here. The, the cost is really in the FFTs. There's the FFT here, here, and here. Of course, they cost all the same. So all uh, that we have to uh, worry about is what is the cost of an FFT. Okay, but that's what we analyzed before. Uh, somewhere here, we had said that an FFT costs P times Q times log Q operations in N. Okay. So uh, let's add this here. This is O of P Q log uh, Q. Now P times Q is N. This is N. And Q is uh, essentially it's the square root of N. So this is square root of N. But the log doesn't care about the square root. So the log of square root of N is a half times log N. But the half is eaten by the O. So I can safely replace this by O of n log n. And uh, yes, and now I have to solve this recurrence. No, uh, okay. So let, let's, let's write this in terms of k. In terms of k, we have t of k is um, uh, um, <coughs> I, uh, let me write uh, less than or equal, then I can make this big O explicit with a certain constant. So Q is uh, 2 to the K half, and then T to the uh, K mm, Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry. And this is Q to the, this is the bigger one. And uh, this here uh, I have here a 1 uh, from this factor of 2, and p is the smaller one, so this is k half plus 1. Okay, this is the recursive call. And then n log n is 2 to the k times k. Uh, and there's a certain constant in it. <coughs> now, uh, I can uh, uh, do an induction argument. Uh, like uh, in this crazy proof that we had uh, in uh, in the first lecture, um, this proof is also uh, requires a little bit of a calculation, but not not quite as crazy as uh, in, in that proof. Uh, but it is similar in structure. So by by uh, by induction hypothesis, I can uh, say that this here is less than what we want to prove it to be. So altogether. Um, let's see, well, let, let me call this a C2, so that I don't know, confuse because I have C2 in the notes. Um, there's a C1 uh, coming from mm, this one. Uh, so, okay, so the claim, just, just to be sure, we want to show that T of K is at most C1 K log K. No. Uh, 2 to the k, k log k. So this is the n, 
this is the log n and this is the log log n and the goal is to show this okay so okay so let's see uh, we have uh, 2 to the k half from here and then this expression with k replaced by this argument so it's 2 to the k half plus 1 and then k half plus 1 and then log k half plus 1 plus the other part plus c2 2 to the k k okay and now, now we simplify this a little bit um, so first of all this uh, log here the argument of the log I can bound by uh, three quarters of k because I can assume k is large and when k is large then this is certainly true so this uh, larger coefficient here so three quarters is la uh, greater than a half and this is sufficient to eat this one because the one is constant and then I can uh, say what I do with this log I can say okay this log is uh, log 2 so altogether it's uh, less than log uh, k minus log uh, 4 uh, third so actually it's plus 3 quarters but 3 quarters is less than 1 and then the log is less than 1 so I uh, want to uh, put it upside down to make the minus explicit now this is something which is uh, positive okay <clears throat> so what do we do on the other side um, uh, those two factors uh, combine to 2 to the k and then here okay here I have a k half and here I have a times 2 so this uh, eats each other and then there's a, a, a 1 here which is also multiplied by this 2 so altogether this one is less than a k plus 2 all right so now I have to multiply this uh, k plus 2 with this log k minus f log uh, constant. Okay, what is this? This here is at most, okay, this is k log k. Oh, this looks good. k log k from this one with this one minus uh, k log 4 third is this one with this one uh, plus 2 log k and this one with this one minus 2 log 4 over 3 okay so let's uh, write this uh, down uh, together mm. Um, okay, uh, C1, 2 to the k, k log k, coming from this one, plus, and uh, here in the next one, I have here uh, uh, this factor 2 to the k from here, with this one, um, and a constant, is essentially the same as what I have here. So let me combine this and say this is um, mm, oh no, uh, no I, sorry, I was one step ahead. Um, I uh, let's see what do I want. Oh yeah, okay, okay, that's. Okay, let's first deal with uh, yeah. Let's first deal with this here. Okay, so this is uh, two to the k, c one, two log k minus two log four third, and now now the part that I wanted to do before, I say plus this is c uh, two uh, minus c1 log 4 third 
2 to the k. Okay. Okay. Okay, so th this here can be simplified. We can estimate this. Um, because this is this is uh, what is this? Um, or we can generously uh, uh, bound this above um, because this is log k, so I can bound it by k. K uh, goes faster than log, uh, so um, that's very fair. Then I can even choose my favorite coefficients. So this is less than a half um, k log uh, four third. So this is again assuming that k is sufficiently large, then this will certainly be true. And I'm choosing this so that I can cancel this one with this one. Um, because what, what I want to have in the end is this. This is already the final result. Uh, but unfortunately there's a plus here and so I have to I have to ensure that the whole thing is somehow negative because I want to get the conclusion that uh, it's less than or equal only this one. So a plus is not helpful. I've chosen this estimate here so that I can compensate it with this one and here I have a minus. Um, so I can um, <coughs> uh, yeah I can uh, combine this one with this one and then uh, I can still choose how C1 and C2 are related. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, if, if I combine all this uh, dangerous part together, I get that this is at most a C2 minus, okay, and then it's uh, a half, yeah, so this is a half minus uh, one, this is minus a half, uh, log c1 log 4 third times uh, 2 to the uh, k times k. Okay, and now I choose without loss of a generality. Um, I make sure that the c1 is greater than the c2 um, so that this one is greater than this one and then this one is negative and then only the first part survives. And then I'm done. <coughs> okay, so this is the uh, this is the uh, this is the proof of this complexity estimate. And I said already this is world record, and it also, uh, yeah, uh, once more the remark that this uh, here uh, is not a restriction. If you want to really multiply, and just choose the n large enough so that the rem doesn't do any harm. Okay. So this is the uh, the uh, schönhagen strassen algorithm. Uh, if you look into a book. Uh, then you will see it often represented uh, in a in a slightly uh, with a slight modification, um, so that it multiplies here not mod x to the n minus one, but instead with uh, x to the n plus one. Uh, okay, so um, how is this done? If you if you want to do it like this, um, you uh, observe that if you take x. Uh, modulo this polynomial, then x is even a 2nth uh, root of unity. That's because minus 1 is a, is a second root of unity. So if you take x to the n uh, uh, and you say plus 1 is equal to 0, that means x to the n is equal to minus 1. So with this it's a 2nth root of unity. Okay, and uh, <coughs> if you choose p and q as before, then you can translate the f and g uh, so as to get a, a recursion into uh, into elements of this ring with plus here and there, and that allows you then to apply uh, the idea of Schönhagen and Strassen recursively. Um, but then, if you want to do an FFT, you have to get back 
the minus um, because the plus doesn't help you. So uh, um, in order to do an FFT here, um, we have to modify this a little bit. And the, but that's not a problem because we have a two Qth rule of unity, omega, and we can replace the X, the capital X, by omega capital X. Well, that's not a big deal. Um, if we have uh, this, uh, yeah, if, if F times G is equal to H mod X to the Q plus one, and you replace uh, X by omega times X, then you replace it here and here and also here. But here you have omega to the Q, and omega is supposed to be a 2Qth root of unity. So omega to the Q is minus 1, and this is minus x to the Q plus 1, and in the mod it doesn't matter whether you have the minus here or there, so altogether this is this. You can, achieve, uh, you can achieve this substitution uh, both uh, for introducing the omega and afterwards for removing the omega in linear time. So the total cost of the algorithm doesn't change if you do it. Uh, it doesn't get worse, but it also doesn't get any better. So I'm not exactly sure uh, why it is presented with this uh, modification. Uh, in this in this modified version in, in most of the literature. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a bit concerned that in the way I presented it to you, I'm somewhere missing a subtle detail. If you see where it is and why this one is necessary, I think it's not necessary, but if you think it's necessary, uh, uh, talk to me. I would be interested to know. Okay. So we have shown that uh, schoenhage strassen algorithm is a fast algorithm. It's fast in theory. Another question is whether it's fast in practice. And I promised that uh, we will discuss things that are fast in practice, but how can I prove that something is fast in practice? Um, the, the only thing is uh, you have to program it and test it. So here, here's a comparison. Um, I this is for polynomials over the integers um, and I use a, a certain old computer algebra system. I'm not naming it, but it's a, it's a real one. It's not a fake data. I'm showing you a, a, a actual data. Uh, an old computer algebra system that just uses the classical multiplication algorithm that uh, uses quadratic time. And I use a, a certain version of Sage uh, that uh, uses the schoenhage strassen algorithm, as I explained it. And uh, here is the quadratic runtime of this, uh, algo uh, of this computer algebra system X. And uh, so we see here the size, the size means the degree of the polynomials. And here we uh, see the computation time. So for polynomials of degree uh, 10,000, we would need approximately 100 seconds, so almost two minutes. And then uh, quadratic time in complexity means that when you double the size, the computation time gets multiplied by four. Okay. Uh, whereas if we have an n log n uh, complexity, this is more or less linear. So it's a bit more than linear because of the log, but roughly it's linear. It's quasi linear sometimes they say. Um, and that means doubling the input size uh, uh, leads to a doubling of the costs. Uh, but the question is now, like uh, with Karatsuba and its friends, whether uh, where is the crossover point? So what, what do you think? There is the, uh, there's the yellow uh, plot that I've shown already. I have not yet disclosed the green one. Uh, but you can now make up your mind whether you expect it to be here or here or here or here, and uh, all of this is wrong. I'll show you where it is, here. It's so much more efficient that you cannot even reasonably compare the two algorithms in this uh, uh, problem range uh, in the same plot. So, uh, of course, so this looks like it costs no time. Of course, it doesn't cost no time. Uh, you have to zoom in. Um, okay, but if you zoom in, uh, then 
you, you also don't see much because then this looks almost like, like it's vertical. So for uh, 10 to the 4 uh, degree you need a hundredth of a second instead of 100 seconds. This means it's 10,000 times faster for this problem size. And this is a small problem size. So uh, yeah, you would easily be uh, able with this algorithm to multiply much uh, much larger polynomials. <coughs> oh, I thought I have an additional picture. Um, so if, if you see, so you see here, this goes roughly linear. You don't you don't see uh, the log in this picture, and you also certainly don't see the log log in this picture. But you can imagine, or you can extrapolate, what happens uh, with polynomials that have millions uh, of coefficients. Uh, Sage will still be able to handle them, but this polynomial. Uh, uh, this uh, polynomial multiplier and this alternative computer algebra system has no uh, chance to do it. It would take millions of years uh, when Sage just needs an hour. Okay, because here every doubling of the problem size uh, multiplies the uh, computation time by four, and this this is uh, uh, com gets you completely out of range. So this is really fast, uh, both in theory and in practice, and this is good. Um, multiplication is a fundamental operation, and multiplication of polynomials is a fundamental operation in computer algebra. So it's uh, good that we achieved uh, a good complexity for this. Um, we have shown uh, that we can do it in n log n log log n, uh, but we don't know uh, whether it can be done better. Um, there, uh, there are reasons to assume that you cannot avoid the, the log n, uh, but perhaps you can avoid the log log n. Um, uh, we don't know. It's, uh, it's always more difficult to show uh, lower bounds for the complexity than upper bounds. Um, anyway, this is the state of the art. This is, this is what we know how to do, and this is what also works well in practice. Um, but now when we uh, go on to uh, analyze the complexity of algorithms that depend on multiplication, it would be uh, not a good idea to just always plug this uh, expression into the complexity analysis for two reasons. Uh, first, a reason is that somebody might come next day and uh, uh, prove a, a better complexity estimate for polynomial multiplication, and then we would have to update all the complexity estimates for all the algorithms that we'll discuss in the next few lectures that depend on fast multiplication because they also then would become faster. And that, that's, uh, that's not a good thing to do. The other reason is that uh, when we want to understand the complexity of advanced algorithms that use fast multiplication, uh, we want to get a complexity estimate that, that tells us something, that tells us somehow where the complexity comes from. And if we just plug in this expression, uh, then we don't see very much and we just get an expression. Uh, it's therefore uh, better if we use a placeholder, we introduce a placeholder uh, instead of this specific bound that we proved, uh, we will just uh, define a certain function m uh, and call it a multiplication time if there is an algorithm that multiplies any two polynomials over an arbitrary ring of degrees less than n with no more than m of n operations in R. And we will express uh, subsequently uh, um, complexity estimates in terms of this uh, somehow unknown function m uh, that you may instantiate if you like uh, with, uh, with this expression, uh, or if you don't like, you can instantiate it with n square, uh, <coughs> and then you get a concrete uh, uh, estimate. Okay, so uh, uh, this this function should refer to an. Um, you can think of it as a as the best possible, but possibly unknown uh, uh, algorithm or the complexity of the best. Uh, possible uh, uh, algorithm, uh, but you can also think of it as the complexity of a certain known algorithm, for example, the one that we discussed 
uh, today. Uh, so we will we will have complexity estimates that involve this uh, M, and we will have to obtain these complexity estimates, and we will only be able to obtain them if we have some assumptions about M. So let's make some assumptions that are reasonable. Uh, uh, there are two assumptions that we want to make. Uh, one assumption is that uh, well, we, we are not completely stupid. Um, we don't want to spend more than quadratic time for uh, multiplication, um, and that can be translated into this estimate. So uh, this uh, says that we, we, we don't want to use a multiplication algorithm that is worse than the standard algorithm. Okay, that's one estimate. And the other estimate says um, it's, it's unlikely that somebody will come along and uh, tell us that uh, it's possible to multiply polynomials in less than linear time. Less than linear time is uh, certainly not possible uh, b because there are n coefficients in the input uh, and all the coefficients of the output depend somehow on all the coefficients of the input in the sense that if you just toggle one of the input coefficients um, then something changes in the output. That means you have to at least look at every input coefficients at every input coefficient and if there are linear if there are n input coefficients that means you have to spend a linear amount of time at least for looking at the input now oh, okay looking at the input is not an arithmetic operation but you will have to touch at, at each coefficient at least once um, okay so uh, it's fair to assume that it's linear uh, and uh, this can be expressed by this uh, inequality this assumption um, that we will later use when we do complexity estimates for algorithms that uh, take advantage of fast multiplication. Good. Uh, this concludes this uh, section on fast multiplication in arbitrary univariate polynomial rings. Um, let's now turn to discussion of uh, integer multiplication. So the task is now uh, we, are two, we are given two integers, uh, let's call them again f and g, even though that looks like polynomials, um, but it's also a nice name for integers. f and g are integers, and now uh, instead of a degree, we have digits. And uh, you may have seen in uh, computer algebra 1 that there's a uh, tight analogy between integers and polynomials whatever, more or less, whatever you can do for integers, you can do for polynomials, and whatever you can do for polynomials, you can do with the integers, uh, where uh, the digits somehow play the role of, uh, the digits of an integer play the role of the coefficients of polynomial. So that, that analogy doesn't carry out completely. Usually the integers are more complicated if there is a difference between them, and that's because Addition is more complicated than the integers. Addition is more complicated because you have a carry. Uh, we don't have carries in uh, polynomial arithmetic, and that's why polynomials are easier. Anyway, so let's uh, discuss the uh, multiplication problem for integers. Um, there is a theorem of Schoenager and Strassen that says that this can be done in n log n log log n time. And uh, actually, uh, this was uh, the first algorithm that they published. And the algorithm that I explained to you today for polynomials is a polynomial version of this integer multiplication algorithm. So they use the same idea. Uh, the idea was for polynomials to turn x into a, a, a root of unity. Now, uh, there is no x in the integers. Uh, instead, what they use is the number 2. Now use the number 2 and turn the 2 into a root of unity by saying uh, they compute and set mod 2 to the n uh, plus 1. Okay, and then you see this is similar uh, to what we did with the d and the r earlier. Uh, and it turns out that this, this really works out and um, um, possibly uh, uh, it's for the integer version where you need this variation that I explained uh, where you take the two to the uh, where you take x x to the n uh, plus one as modulus instead of minus one. Uh, um, maybe that's uh, uh, necessary in the integer version, 
um, uh, even though I don't see why, why it should be necessary in the, uh, in the polynomial version. Okay, uh, so I, I said that this is a world record. You read this in ma many books, uh, but it's not true anymore. Um, the record was broken and the new record is from 2021. Uh, 50 years later, it was proven by uh, Dave, uh, David Harvey and Joris van der Hoven uh, that there's also an algorithm that multiplies integers in n log n time. So this log log n factor uh, can be saved. Um, so this, uh, 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 this Im improved algorithm didn't, didn't come out of the blue. Uh, there were predecessors uh, around 2008. Uh, uh, there was somebody who uh, already showed that uh, log log n is not the best possible and found a slowly growing function here. Uh, and then uh, Joris van der Hoven and uh, his co authors um, uh, wrote a series of papers where they uh, improved about this uh, factor further until they finally managed to make it constant. I'm not going to explain how this algorithm works. Uh, because it's not in the focus of our interest. Uh, of course, multiplication is in the focus of our interest, uh, but we are uh, interested in uh, algorithms that have uh, a relevance for input of practical, uh, of practical sizes, of, of realistic problem sizes, and that's not the case for this algorithm. This, this algorithm uh, is at this time only of theoretical interest. It's faster than uh, other algorithms, for example the schoenhage strassen algorithm, only for ends that are beyond the scope of any uh, reasonable computing machine uh, in this world. So what you can do uh, if you uh, want to multiply integers is uh, still uh, the schoenhage strassen algorithm. This is uh, one option and uh, several computer algebra systems use this option. Um, but I don't want to explain the integer version uh, of it. I want to explain you an alternative um, um, uh, algorithm, which is uh, theoretically not quite as good as schoenhage strassen but in practice it's, it's sometimes better and sometimes equal and sometimes worse. Uh, so it's good to have two uh, approaches. Here's the idea. Um, Knowing the uh, the digits of f, yeah, knowing f and g means knowing its digits, and uh, the digits uh, digit representation of f and g means that we have we have f and g given in this form where these are the well, the, the digits. Now a computer um, doesn't usually compute with a base of ten. Uh, let's just uh, use w. Uh, for uh, what is called the word size in the computer. Usually it's not 10, sometimes it's 2 in a computer, um, but uh, it can also be 2 to the uh, 64, some power of 2, uh, that's a quite a big number. Let's assume this is the word size. Uh, so the F and the G, we are not talking about how to convert digits uh, from one base to another, we are assuming that they are already given in this base, in this basis. And the idea is now to turn uh, uh, numbers into polynomials. I uh, will uh, replace this w by x and consider the integer as a polynomial over a finite field. And we can discuss what we should choose as a prime. The coefficients here are less than the word size. The, that comes from the digit representation. And uh, that determines the choice of p. So we want to choose the p so that it's not too big and not too small. Mm, okay, so we, we, we want to make it not too big so that we can efficiently do the multiplication in this uh, ring. And we want to make it uh, not too small because we want to recover the integer product by afterwards setting x to w. Okay, that means evaluating this polynomial. Uh, so I want to have the result here should be 
so that the, the coefficients of this polynomial are the digits of the product. Now that, uh, that's uh, con two conflicting goals. I can't make both of them happen because it seems that uh, to efficiently multiply in this uh, ring, I, I would want to have a p that is less than the word size because that means all these uh, elements are less than the word size and with these elements I can multiply and add very quickly. I need just one uh, instruction of the processor. On the other hand, if I uh, want to recover the digits uh, of the product of the integers from the coefficients of the product of the polynomials, then I should choose p not too small. Um, I, I can tell how big the coefficients can become. Each of the coefficients in the input is less than w. And in the uh, polynomial summation formula, uh, I'll always take one, co uh, one coefficient from here and one coefficient from here, multiply them, and I take the sum over all these uh, combinations. Altogether, there may be n things uh, to be summed up, and each uh, sum end is uh, at most uh, w square. So altogether, uh, I should take p at least n times w square. Uh, now, obviously, there is no prime which at the same time is less than w and greater than nw square. Um, but I can escape from this uh, problem by taking several primes. Um, so uh, I choose three primes. And I choose them so that each of these primes is less than uh, 2 to the 64 but not too much less. I want to have them at least 2 to the 63. Okay, And then if I assume that n is less than 1 uh, over 8 times w, that would be still very much, 2 to the 61, uh, then choosing these primes uh, would still ensure, choosing the primes like this, would still ensure that their product is larger than this. So I, I can make both of the things happen if I don't insist in doing it just once. If I do it three times for three different primes, then that would be okay. Okay, so I compute this uh, product of the polynomials once in this ring, once in this ring, and once in this ring. And then I apply Chinese remaindering to the uh, coefficients and I get the product in this ring. And here the coefficient domain is big enough that I can recover the uh, uh, I, I can recover the uh, coefficients or uh, the digits of the product from from these coefficients. Okay. So what's the cost of Chinese remaindering? That doesn't actually matter because the Chinese remaindering uh, is applied to uh, problems of size uh, of fixed size because these primes do not depend on n. Uh, uh, if I think of an input that has n digits, then that doesn't influence the, the choice of p. Uh, so the p's are just hard-coded into the computer program, uh, into this multiplication algorithm, and I always have Chinese remaindering problems with these three primes, and they take a certain amount of time, but this time is fixed. Uh, what enters into the complexity estimate is only how often I have to do it, uh, but this is linear uh, because the, the size of the product is just the sum of the sizes of the inputs, so it's linear in n, if n is the number of digits of n, f, f, and g. Okay, so uh, this is good. And uh, let me point out that there is a bound on n, there is a limit on the number of digits that your input can have, uh, but this is a very comfortable bound. So 2 to the 61 means 10 to the 10, uh, 10 to the 17 uh, if, you, uh, if you translate it into decimal digits. Now 10 to the 17 is really a lot. So this is, uh, this is billions of gigabytes of data. So we, you will hardly ever uh, come into a situation where you will need to uh, multiply integers that are, are longer than that. So it's not, it's not the size of the... It's not the size of the integer itself, it's the number of digits of the integer. So it's really big integers that we can handle in this. Uh, but we are not completely finished yet, 
we want to do the multiplication, we still have to do the multiplications in these rings. So we can do this with Schoenhage Strassen, um, but there's a more clever way uh, of doing it because we, we can choose the piece uh, and uh, there are some uh, limits, uh, restrictions on the sizes of piece, but there are still many options. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the idea is to choose the piece so that uh, in these uh, residue class rings there are already uh, great uh, roots of unity, so that I don't have to go to Schoenhage Strasse for polynomials, but can directly go to the FFT algorithm and get a complexity that is only n log n. Okay. So uh, for this, you'd have to choose, uh, 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 yeah, uh, P's properly, and but you have to do that only once. So here, here's what people have thought. I've copied this from the book of Alfonso Garten and Gerhard. If you take these uh, primes, then they match the uh, size conditions that I specified earlier, and they have uh, nice. Uh, rules of unities to a very high order, 2 to the 57. So the 2 to the 57 is now a new bound for how uh, big the n can be, but 2 to the 57 is not much less than uh, 2 to the 61. So we can compute up to this bound uh, the product of two integers very quickly. Uh, we can compute it in n log n time but this is not a theoretical result because of the bound here on the n. Uh, so uh, computing, I, mean, I, I, shouldn't, I, I shouldn't say this is O of n log n because O of means asymptotic and asymptotic means n grows uh, beyond any bound and here is a bound. So this is really a practical approach. If you, if you want to let n grow uh, indefinitely then you will not get along with three integers but you will have to increase slightly the, uh, the number of, sorry, not the number of integers, the number of primes that you need uh, if you want to stick to this size restrictions, but then you have to take the growth of the number of primes into account in the complexity estimate, and then uh, you won't be happy with the result. But you will be happy with the performance of this because the number of size, uh, the number of primes that you need grows so slowly that it will never grow beyond 3 in this universe. Okay, so this is about fast uh, multiplication in the integers and, and uh, now uh, uh, there's uh, now 15 minutes uh, left uh, roughly, so I can still tell you how to multiply uh, multivariate polynomials. That, that's uh, uh, okay, uh, that's the, the problem is, is this now, uh, you have given f and g two polynomials, uh, polynomials with coefficients in an arbitrary ring, and okay, this works uh, for, for an arbitrary number of variables, but let's keep it simple and, and stick to two uh, variables, uh, x and y, and the task is as before to compute the coefficients of the product. Uh, now we have two degrees for each of the two polynomials that there, there's a degree in x and a degree in y. And the degree in x of the product is the sum of the degrees of x uh, in, the pro uh, in the factors and the same for y. Uh, one way of uh, doing, uh, the, of solving, the, there are two ways of uh, solving this multiplication problem and most of them are very natural. Um, but let's just uh, discuss them a little bit. Um, uh, you, you choose, if you choose n larger than the degree of the product and m larger than the degree of the product with respect to the other variable, then uh, one way of doing the uh, multiplication problem is to turn the bivariate ring into a, a quotient uh, ring where, where there is a root of unity. So um, this is uh, uh, similar to what we did before, but actually uh, simpler than in the schoenhage strassen algorithm because we are not going to apply anything recursively. In the schoenhage strassen algorithm, the uh, y here was obtained as a, as a power of x. You remember, we replaced uh, little x by 
uh, little x to the p by capital X. Uh, here we, we really have two independent variables. Okay, so here I can just say multi computing this product is the same as computing this product modulo this polynomial if n is sufficiently large and modulo this polynomial if m is sufficiently large. But if uh, I'm computing it modulo this one, then I can do it directly with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the Schönhagen-Strassen algorithm because this here is a univariate problem. Okay, so a multiplication. Uh, okay, so this this I know how to how to do. It takes multiplication time. Uh, and then uh, this here is also a polynomial ring over a more complicated uh, coefficient domain. Uh, but I can say what the multiplication here of this large ring costs. Uh, it costs uh, as much, yeah, it costs as a certain number. We use this capital M uh, placeholder now, uh, a certain number of operations in D. But I know what an operation in D costs because an operation in D is at most a multiplication. If it's an addition, it's even faster. But if it's a multiplication, uh, then it costs uh, M of N operations in R. So then I just have to combine the two and obtain directly that the multiplication in the bivariate ring is not more costly than O of M of N, M of M operations in R. Because there are so many operations in D and each operation in D costs so many operations in R. So altogether there are so many operations in R that I have to uh, perform in order to compute to carry out a multiplication in the bivariate polynomial ring. This is one approach. That's the most natural approach to uh, multiplication of polynomials in two variables. Now I tell you the second most uh, natural approach. This is called Kronecker substitution and uh, this is an idea that's worth keeping in mind because it can be applied in other circumstances as well. It's not specific to the multiplication problem. It works for other problems uh, also and can be seen as a, as a tool for developing fast algorithms. So here's the idea. Uh, you, uh, uh, you translate the, we want to translate the multivariate uh, polynomials to univariate polynomials. And we can do so by substituting one of the variables by a power of the other variables. And we will ensure that the exponent of this power is so large that from the result we can recover uh, the bivariate result. Okay, so here's a picture. This is f and g uh, as bivariate polynomials. And uh, uh, we will uh, introduce a, a box around them which is big enough that it covers the uh, that it can cover the result. So if you imagine you multiply these two rect angles, uh, then the degree, let's say this is x, the degree in x of the product is the sum of the degree in x of f and the degree of x of the other polynomial. Uh, so this part is, is supposed to be as long as this part, and this part is supposed to be as long as this part, and the same in the other dimension. So these boxes are big enough to contain uh, H, the product of the two, and now I, uh, I, sp uh, I, I choose the N so that the, uh, the substitution here amounts to splitting these rectangles uh, into slices and making them a long array. Somehow the opposite direction of what we did in Schönhage Strassen, uh, where we took something univariate and uh, turned it into something bivariate, uh, here we, we go the other direction and make it uh, univariate. If I multiply uh, uh, these two polynomials in Rx, then it's just uh, one multiplication, uh, one big multiplication. Uh, and then uh, I get this green polynomial, and this green polynomial contains, because I have introduced these gaps here uh, in a suitable uh, size, so that these coefficients here uh, in the first part are exactly the first slice of the rectangle that contains H, and this is the second slice and so on. So I can uh, recover uh, the uh, multiplication result in the bivariate polynomial by replacing each x to the i that appears in it by x to the rem, i, n, and y to 
the quo i n is again similar to what we did before with Schönhage Strassen. Uh, because if you think of how to do this backwards and replace y by x to the n, then in the exponent you will get n times quotient plus remainder, and that's exactly i. Okay, so uh, this is the algorithm as a summary, uh, f and g, bivariate polynomials, and, uh, d, uh, and n and m are some numbers so that I know that the degrees of the product with respect to x and y are less than n and m, respectively, and the output of the algorithm is the product of the two polynomials. So the idea uh, is to uh, tr make the polynomials univariate, and this happens here, and again this is an operation that doesn't cost anything, it doesn't cost any operations just to shuffle the uh, uh, yeah, coefficient arrays around and make uh, rectangles into lines. Uh, here is where the work happens. I have to do one big multiplication of uh, two univariate polynomials. And afterwards, uh, I, and I have to do again an operation that doesn't cost anything. Okay, the rem and the quo cost a little bit, but it's not an operation that we count. We count operations in the ground ring, um, and the ground ring, uh, well, the, the exponents don't live in the ground ring, they are just integers and not integers with millions of digits, but reasonable integers. So this is something that we don't take into account. We could take it into account, it wouldn't change anything. So what does this cost? Yeah, it costs as much as the degree of these polynomials is. And the degree of these polynomials is the size of uh, this rectangle. If you split it into uh, splice, uh, yeah, if, if you split it into slices uh, and put it into a very long list, well, then it's still it's just the area of this rectangle. This is an n times m rectangle. So if you put it into slices of length 1 and attach them all together, you will get a rectangle that is very slim, has just a size 1 in one direction, and then size n times m in the other direction. So you see we get a different result. Uh, the complexity is m of n times m. And you actually don't need the big O here, it's exactly m times m of n times m operation in R. Now you may wonder if this is faster or slower than the other one, where we had m of n times m of n. And the answer is uh, that depends on the multiplication time. Uh, for, for some multiplication times, uh, this one is faster, and for other multiplication times, the other is faster. And in, in practice, uh, one approach can be faster than the other, regardless of the multiplication time, uh, because they, they are almost uh, equal, uh, and then implementation details uh, um, make, the, make the decision of what, what is really faster. It's good to know both. And uh, this, this is uh, uh, everything I wanted to say about uh, uh, multiplication uh, of multivariate polynomials. And then now we have talked a lot about multiplication. Next time uh, we'll talk about division. And uh, this is also a fundamental operation, obviously, division with remainder of univariate polynomials. And when we are done with this, then this concludes the first uh, part of the course. So for now, uh, thanks for uh, watching and listening. And see you again next time uh, when we do division.